1977, and we're recording A Farewell to Kings. On stage, we've been showcasing several new songs, an excellent way to work out the bugs and finesse the parts before laying them down on tape. Our producer, Terry Brown, meanwhile, found a residential studio called Rockfield in a rustic spot in Monmouthshire, just over the Welsh border. And we headed there straight after our last UK gig with our band crew, a grand total of seven people, for our first recording session abroad, the one that would result in a farewell to Kings. When our buses and trucks pulled into Rockfield's ancient looking farmhouse, surrounded by grazing sheep and cows, and we unloaded what was now an arsenal of guitars, percussion, and keyboards, it was truly like the circuits had arrived. Fans often point to Alex's acoustic playing on A Farewell to Kings as evidence of his versatility. So this seems like a good moment to reflect on the man's talent. I know I'm biased, but I do think he's the most underrated guitarist in the rock band. <laughs> gotten his due from the mainstream or critical rock world. Neil and I used to call him our musical scientist, for he is surely one of the great chord inventors, creating his own inversions and unusual intricacies of arpeggiation. He's a fluid and dexterous riffologist, one of rock's most original soloists, a confident an emotive blues rock guitarist at only 18 who went on to develop his own blend of heavy rock, blues, classical, and more. Is that enough sucking up for you, Lewis? <laughs> his genius is one of spontaneity, his best ideas mostly coming in flashes and sparks that you have to grab in the heat of the moment. Get too methodical with him and he'll lose interest. From our earliest days writing, I'd keep a tape machine beside me, even just a cassette player, because so often, without even thinking, he'd play a figure that was just brilliant. And if I said, whoa, let's build a song around that, he'd have to have a listen back to painfully, painstakingly relearn the very thing he just played off the cuff. <laughs> Knowing that about him, whenever we worked with a new producer or engineer, I'd sit right there in the control room during Alex's warm-ups and make sure the record button was on, lest they miss those happy accidents. The mixing sessions for A Farewell to Kings were booked at the legendary AdVision Studios in London, where another dream came true for me. My favorite band, Yes, had recorded there. Time and a Word, the Yes album, Fragile, and close to the edge were either recorded or mixed or both at AdVision. And for us deep-dyed Yes fans, just being in that room momentarily breathed an air of magic into our project. Well, that was the first impression anyway. In the long run, the atmosphere proved workmanlike and unglamorous, devoid of any suggestion that between those ordinary walls so many monumental records had been made. We just settled in and buckled down to work. I could go into brain-numbing detail about what mixing a record entails, but I'll spare you that. Suffice to say, it's a torturous exercise in second-guessing your ears, juggling numerous alternate mixes ad nauseum until your hearing burns out and you've lost all your precious objectivity. And out of such tedium and frustration comes chaos. Enter lurks the artist. As we were witness to the rise of the punk scene that summer of 1977, with bands like the Sex Pistols and the Clash in the news all the time, during yet another mixing lull at AdVision, Alex spent his time sketching out a character he invented called Frank Lee Shite. <laughs> cross between Mohawk Street Urchin and Frankenstein's monster with a safety pin through his effing neck. With the drawing finished, he wrapped his head 
in toilet paper with a spoon poking out from his forehead. Very punk. Then he pulled his hoodie over the top and snuck out the back of the studio, re-entering via the front entrance and presenting himself to a very puzzled receptionist as the manager of Frank Lee Scheidt and his band, the Rüten Nazis. <laughs> he showed her this fine drawing and asked to meet the studio owner to book time for his rising star. The look on her face was somewhere between polite confusion and, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> While around the corner, Neil and I were giggling like eight-year-olds. Is he doing it? Nah, he wouldn't. Yeah, he's fucking doing it. Oh my God, the man has balls. I should mention that although our music could not have been more defiantly out of step with current trends, we were impressed by the public relations savvy those punk bands had, their ability to grab the page at every turn. And of course, their unbridled energy was admirable. But while their three chord mantras were fun, for a musician, they could be boring, as I'm sure they'd say about us. But without question, one thing that happened was that punk, immediately legitimized us. When we first got going, we'd been considered a kind of crude prog band compared to Yes, Genesis, or Zeppelin. The perception, the criticism, was that we were a pale imitation. But as soon as punk came along, we were up there with Yehudi Menuhin. <laughs> so they did us a huge favor. I will admit, that I never attended a punk concert, but I did hear lots of tales from our driver, Bill Churchman. Now, I know that sounds very rock and roll aristocrat from our driver, but Bill, an affable Eastender, who explained to me exactly what is required to be a true cockney, that you must have been born within the sound of the bow bells. <laughs> He would tell us terrible stories about having to drive some of these punk bands around. Yes, the same bands that supposedly disdained such luxuries were being driven around by the same chauffeur. The main difference being that when he drove Rush around, there was no danger of us shitting in his car. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I'd like, I'd like uh, to do the Q&A answer your questions, I'd like to bring out one of my favorite actors. Would you come on out, Mr. Lurk Slifeson? Would you like to explain to the audience what they are and how they came to be? 
Okay, um, yeah, so when the show started, there was an instrumental version of one of them, which we'll play again as you are leaving with the full vocals. But there are two songs that I found when I was writing the memoir. My good friend and co-writer uh, for My Favorite Headache, co-producer of My Favorite Headache, Ben Mink, found this tape of two songs we had written and produced in 1999 and 2000. Uh, and our original intention, of course, was to include them on My Favorite Headache, but the subject matter of those songs was a little different. The song Gone was written after Neil's daughter, Selena, passed away. And so it was kind of, it wasn't directly about her loss, but it was about what we all feel when someone disappears suddenly from our lives and you're scrambling to make sense of it. Uh, but I thought at the time, perhaps it's too close to the bone, and it, it might upset Neil, so I left it off the album. And the other song was a song about a conversation, a series of conversations my wife and I have been having. Plug your ears, Nance. Uh, <laughs> and again, it was quite personal, so those were two songs we left off. But once hearing them 24 years later, I was kind of amazed that they had taken on a different context. And uh, I asked my friend David Bottrell, who has mixed some Rush albums and produces one of our favorite bands, Tool, uh, if he would have a listen. He did so and said, why don't you let me clean these up? And he did his magic with them and recorded some new drums. And, and I was really, really pleased with the results. So they're on my audiobook and they're available however you listen to music these days. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the story, so thank you. So, so go, I'll ask, I'll say your name, you will stand up, you'll wave to Getty and add in Alex, uh, and then I will ask the question for two very obvious reasons. I have the mic. And I've got a big head. <laughs> so, so it's going to go. So is that? Thank you. So is Tony Crimmings from Cork in Ireland here, please? Tony? Right. It's a strong Make a noise. Wave your hand.